Testing. Testing. Yes. Not yet. I have a little video to play. Hey, Dawn. Good evening, everybody. How are you tonight? Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I have, I always start by asking how you guys have enjoyed the weather, right? It's getting a little chilly, but we had some good weather the other day. I have a little video I'd like to share with you because not everybody is on Facebook. And before we get into Philippians, you know, it is Christmas season, and I do want to share this little Christmas video that uh, Crystal and I made when we were at the park the other day, enjoying the beautiful weather considering Christmas. Amen? All right. You know, as I'm here at the park playing with Caleb, um, just thinking about Christmas time and just thinking about how God must have felt enjoying his time in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, and how knowing that one day he is going to say, okay, I'm going to have to let you go into the world and I need you to leave, and I need you to go and do something that only, only we can do. And I couldn't imagine how that must have felt for the Father to see His only begotten Son go, to die for the sins of the world. But what brought the greatest joy is when God must have seen Christ returning with the work accomplished, doing exactly uh, what He set out to do, and uh, I just give all the glory to God, and I thank God that out of his love for humanity and out of his sovereignty, he sent Christ, our Savior, into the world to die for our sins. Thank you, God. Thank you for Christmas. Amen. You know, uh, Pastor Crystal is very creative, extremely creative, and very blessed by God. And it was her idea, and she came up when we were in the park the other day, and she just had this whole idea. And I was just like, yes, amen. It, it's, uh, it's good to be reminded of, of just that perspective uh, of what Christmas is about. We celebrate Christmas, amen? amen. Uh, we celebrate Christmas as a reminder for the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen? amen. Praise God for that. Well, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you tonight, Lord God, grateful, Lord Jesus, grateful for Christmas time, grateful for uh, each other who are here, grateful for uh, your Holy Spirit teaching us and leading us and guiding us through life, Lord God. Uh, we come to this Bible study tonight to learn, Lord Jesus, and I pray, Father God, that you will lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are at our final chapter of the book of Philippians, amen? Who knows how long it'll take to get through the chapter though, right? Because we take our time and we're really going detailed, but here's an overview of the book of Philippians and what is the whole book about? Rejoice in the Lord always, amen? It's an encouraging letter. There's many things that we went into detail about that Paul deals with, it helps us with our character, it helps us with our walk, it helps us in the unity of the church. But the main concept that he has throughout the book is always going back to rejoice and always going back to joy that surpasses understanding. And it's an encouraging letter. And there's so many depths that we go into, but then we always come out looking at it like, there's so much to give glory to God about. There's so much to have joy about. Amen? We're going to be talking about that a little bit tonight. And in chapter 4, Paul's final exhortations and rejoicing in blessings. Amen? Remembering that Paul writes this entire letter from where? From, from prison. Amen? And he still has a joyful message to give us. Last week, Paul ended chapter 3 by saying, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the glorious hope that we have. Do you believe in that? Because our entire gospel and our faith hinges on the resurrection, on the hope that we have for our future. And then Paul starts ver chapter 4 by saying, therefore, understanding this, being reminded when there's all these other things that we could worry about in life, but therefore being reminded about the resurrection and the hope that we have and who God really is and who Jesus Christ really is and where he really is. Being reminded of all of this, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Paul professes his love for the Philippians with this term of endearment. My dear brothers and sisters, I love you. That's what he says to them. It's the outpouring of his heart. There's real feelings that are behind what he's saying. This is the heart of a true pastor. They are not just members of the church. There is nothing more he wants than to see these beloved friends uh, in the resurrection. He wants to see them in the resurrection. He knows the resurrection is real. We preach the resurrection. He preached the resurrection. He reminds us and says the resurrection is, a, is ahead of us. We're in it. God has saved us. He's doing a work in our lives. But he says here, but stay true to the Lord. Stay true. Stand firm in your faith and your beliefs. Amen? In Daniel 12, 3, it says, those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will will shine like the stars forever. And this is what he's reminded of. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. His love for these people that he's preaching to has, has one goal in mind, that we get to the resurrection and that we spend eternity with God our Father. And his job is to remind everybody in the midst of uh, what's happening in their community, in their lives, of any disunity, of anything leading people away from faith. He says, guys, take your focus off of all of those, these momentary things that we go through in life, these little times that we go through. Don't think about those things. Remember what is eternal, God. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Amen? He considers their salvation as a crown. He says, the reward that I receive is seeing you with me in heaven. Amen? Their presence with him before God at the end of time will testify that he did not run his race in vain, that he accomplished the work that he began, that he stayed at it. He didn't just go preach a message to them and say, all right, guys, you're on your own. He pastored them, even from afar, even from prison. He still sent letters teaching them because of a deep love of what? Their salvation and their eternal lives. Amen? And he encourages them again to stay true to the Lord. The resurrection is a fact, and it is possible to fall away from God. And Paul reminds us to proactively stand firm in our faith and stay true to the Lord. Amen? And we need that reminding at all times. We need to be reminded because we all have tendencies to get distracted in life, to get caught up by whatever is uh, gossip or whatever is going on in the church uh, that we're interested in, and it makes us question uh, you, you, you know the, the people that we're scrutinizing and it could affect people's faith and that's happening in this church and we're going to go into a little more detail about that amen and verse 2 through 3 he says now I appeal to Yodia and to Syntyche please because you belong to the Lord settle your disagreement and he calls these two out by name. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Amen? You know, uh, this may not be a timely message, but as we go through our Bible studies, chronologically as we're reading it through, we get to a, a place like this. And we're going to leave here with, with, with some information that is going to help us at some point of our life. Because what we talk about tonight is stuff that we're going to inevitably encounter. Okay? Paul immortalized the names of Yodia and Syntyche and somewhat blindsided them by exposing them and their quarrels 
and as a cause of his major concern he has for the health of the church. He writes this whole encouraging letter, the book of Philippians, this letter about joy, helping us understand our walk, where our priorities need to be. And in the final chapter, he then brings up these two people. Amen? Apparently, their quarreling has negatively affected the church. Paul is exhibiting the unlikable but necessary work of a pastor by dealing with something effectively. And there's a reason why he mentions it by name. His approach was gentle because he didn't start his letter by pointing these two out and saying, hey, my whole letter is going to be about these people. He teaches and puts us in the right perspective of serving the kingdom of God joyfully. We're encouraged. We're happy. He's giving us examples. And we're looking and we're like, that's what I want to be like. I want to serve God like Timothy, like Epaphroditus. I want to serve God like Paul. I want to follow Jesus. I want to keep my eyes fixed on Christ. That's what is invoked in us as we're reading through the letter. And then he gets to this part and it reveals this entire letter has also had something I need to deal with in the back of my mind. And it's here and we're going to deal with it. Amen? It's similar to the way Nathan exposed King David's sin. If you guys remember the story about David, amen, where he committed adultery with Bathsheba, King David. And then he had Bathsheba's husband, which was a friend to David, killed to cover up his sin. Tragic, right? But how did Nathan deal with it? We're just going to read through that portion of Scripture real quick. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David the story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. It's horrible, right? As anyone hears that story, they're like, oh my gosh. And he's telling this story to King David. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed. Any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. You see, like Paul did the same thing in his letter. He taught us this great lesson and how to be and also how not to be. Amen? Remember those who are enemies of the cross. That's what we were talking about last week. So he gave us examples of be like this, not like this. And we're, we're like, yes, I want to be like that. And think about these two ladies, that they're there reading the letter too, hearing the letter read too. They're involved. They're like, yes, I want to be like this. And then he calls them out by name. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kings of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Think about what God has already done for you. Think about what God has already provided. And Yodia and Sintai are reminded of that too. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That is the result. That is the appropriate result. The confession. Being able to be humble. If Yodi and Sintai could hear this letter, after being encouraged of every way to be, after Paul calls them out by name, for them to look at it and say, you're right. You're right. Thank you, pastor, for pointing out my shortcomings. Thank you, because they had an effect on the church community. Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for the sin. Your names are still written in the book of life. 
All of us have fallacies. Amen? All of us have shortcomings and faults. All of us could possibly do something that could affect the faith of an onlooker just by carelessness. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. And as a result, there are disastrous consequ uh, consequences. And in the Philippian church, I can imagine if Paul is going to the extent of bringing up these two ladies by name and dealing with something publicly, it's because the church and the faith of others has been affected. Amen? And the only right thing for Pastor Paul to do is to deal with the situation and to say, guys, I've, I've not just reprimanded you. I've given us the glorious tools that we have so that we can accomplish what God has called us to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to deal with our issues along the way. You won't die, but as a result of your negligence or carelessness, how many have died, so to say? How many onlookers have wandered from the faith? And you will see this in any church at any given time. Why? Because we're people and there'll always be something like this going on. Thank God there's nothing like that going on right now. Amen? Praise God. Paul first reminded them of the selfless love of Jesus that was exhibited on the cross for the sake of people uh, and that we're to be like-minded with Christ. Remember how Paul has been teaching us, be selfless. Look at Christ as the example. Don't be selfish. Don't put your stomachs first. Don't make your stomachs your Lord. Don't do things for, for your earthly desires, but do things for God. Be selfless. Make sure that everything we do is for the sake of others. Amen? Paul also praised individuals who adopted a mind similar to that of Christ and condemned those who have their mind set on earthly things than themselves. He gave us those two contrasts. That's what we've been going back and forward with over the past few weeks. Be like this. Don't be like this. And we're encouraged with the examples. When we see the examples explained, we learn from the examples and we're encouraged. We say, yes, I want to be like that. Amen? Paul speaks very frankly without detailing the particulars of the dispute. He doesn't say, this is what they did. This is what they're quarreling over. He doesn't go into any of the details. He, he, he doesn't need to. He doesn't go into particular. And he teaches us that our priority should to, uh, should be to put our differences aside and have the same mind as the Lord. That's it. He doesn't explain the situation. He just gives a blanket solution. The solution is when our priority is on Christ. And it goes back to the last chapter. Fix your eyes on Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus. There are greater eternal things to be focused on than temporal problems that we can all get swept away with in this world. Amen? And it's something we'll all face at any given time. Amen? He says, please. Amen? Where am I? He says, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your uh, uh, disagreement. He's polite, but he's urgent. He's being polite, but he says, please, this must, th there must be a solution to this. This must get dealt with because your actions are affecting people. He does not address them dismissively as subordinates, but acknowledges that they are co-laborers who worked with him, not under him, worked with him. He says, guys, we're all serving the same kingdom over here. I worked with you. You worked with me. So he's not just talking to them down dismissively as subordinates and criticizing them and condemning them and saying, uh, you, you know, like, what's wrong with you? He, he's saying, we work together in this. He did not tell them to stop causing trouble and to submit to leadership. Paul understood that these women had sufficient independence in a Romanized city and they were significant leaders. Amen? <clears throat> <clears throat> they had meaningful roles in the work of the gospel. So these ladies are important. They have a calling. They're significant in the community. They're effective. If they can cause disunity by a quarrel they're having on the side because people are looking what's going on, that means they're significant, and Paul acknowledges that. He's not talking to them as two regular people. He's saying, hey, you guys are important. People look to you. People understand you. This is a Romanized culture, so these women at this part of the Bible do have a voice and are effective in ministry, which is Paul's, why Paul's so concerned about the situation. Amen? <clears throat> 
and their roles were significant enough to cause a rift when they were at odds with each other. What have we learned? I want to hear from you guys. As we go through the situation, what wheels have been turning in your head? Dawn. Does that happen? Yeah. Unfortunately. And they may not have the opportunity to hear the very words that change their lives. So it's important to settle our differences, yeah. mainly, right? Um, who had their hand up? Uh, Diane? Uh, Mitch, go ahead. Hmm. A mediator. You know, it's interesting that Paul says, and I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women. He brings up something publicly to the people, but he also says, you know, understand them, but they also need help. So there's a couple things we learned. We learned mainly, if it's us who are involved in it, that we need to settle our differences because there are way more important things. And the last thing we want, if we're all ministers of reconciliation, is to affect the faith of someone else. Amen? Mitch. Amen. Brothers, sisters, co-laborers, human beings with fallacies in a temporary moment of disagreement that happens in people's lives. It would be a tragedy if a temporary disagreement, which they'll surely get over eventually like most of us do when we're in any disagreement with anybody, would have devastating effects of someone else's faith. That, that would, that's a big problem. That's why it's a problem. Amen. Okay, praise God. Amen. <clears throat> it teaches us how to deal with the possible fallacies of people. Amen? Possible. Possible. How do we deal with them? Accept that they exist sometime. Accept that you're going to see it sometime. Accept that it happens in human beings' lives. Amen? And it also teaches us not to get sidetracked by the temporary disagreements between people but keep our eyes focused on Christ and our priorities in being like-minded with Christ. He reminds us, guys, even if you see this, don't let it affect you, which is why he's bringing it up to the audience of an entire audience. He could have written just them a letter, right? right. And just saying, hey, we're going to deal with this in the office behind closed doors. But he says, no, church, we need to confront the reality that these things happen, and it's okay. Because they happen, and it can happen with anybody, and that's okay. All we need to do is get over it and remember what our priority is in life. 
serving the kingdom of God and advancing the gospel, of which these two are awesome at, very effective at. They're significant in the eyes of so many people, so it's okay. And it's important that he brought that up publicly so that people could sit there and be like, you're right, after you telling us all these three chapters about what to be joyful about, encouraged about, who to be like, to aspire to be like Jesus, to be like-minded, to fix our eyes on Christ, to serve the kingdom of God, to look forward to the resurrection. Yeah, that's who we are. And you're right. It's wise to just accept this. Amen? It is unique for Paul to mention their names, which makes it clear that his reason is not focused on settling the disputes between two people. He's not focused on, hey, let's talk about what they argued about and let's settle that. Amen? but that their dispute affects the community in general. Whatever the dispute may be, it just adversely affecting the community. That's it. That's the problem at hand. Not what they're quarreling about, just the fact that w a quarrel could affect people. Amen? Paul's primary concern is the progress of the gospel and that disputes can only disincline onlookers from coming to faith. That's his problem. That's why he's bringing it up to everybody. The fact that you guys have a problem or affecting people. So I need to bring you guys up to tell people, don't worry about it. It happens. It's okay. Amen. Diane. Oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. What a learning experience when you see two people disagree who are significant, people that we look up to, reconcile. Oh, praise God, amen? To see the reconciliation take place. Pastor Dan. Mm. But we're supposed to be peaceful. Amen. So I think this is something that he's really pointing out to him. We're important people are in disagreement. And he, he, he addresses the size of and says, look, we're partners. Be a peacemaker. You know, have a role in fighting this issue. Amen. Praise God. We all, we all should have that in mind, right? When we see something like this, how can we be a peacemaker? How can we be involved? Don't get affected by it. Don't walk away from faith. Don't even consider it that way. Why? Because what's happening in this little moment of time is nothing compared to eternity. It's just, just a tiny little grain of sand in eternity. Amen? <clears throat> Paul's primary concern is the progress of the gospel and that disputes can only disincline onlookers from coming to faith. We have a responsibility to handle our disputes and disagreements in a way that does not negatively affect the faith of others. What a big responsibility. Drama, right? We, we all could have drama, but how important is it, is it uh, for us as Christians to, to not let drama do damage? It's very, very important. So it is a responsibility of us to, as Christians to learn. Well, what do we do in these situations? And thank God for the Bible, which teaches us all these things about life and eternity and the Spirit of God and salvation and the mysteries revealed and all these awesome things can also, when you go into study and just read a couple verses like this, be taught a life lesson on what do you do when we confront these other little things that we face in life, which could have major damaging effect on our faith or other people's faith. Is it important to talk about? Apparently, it's in the Bible. The inspired word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, useful for teaching. Amen? <clears throat> Amen. Praise God. Clement must have obviously been a respected member of the community, and Paul is subtly encouraging the hearers of this letter not to think less of these ladies because of their capacity to disagree. It's important that the pastor is also saying that. Guys, don't think any less of these great women of God. They co-labored with me. 
They have a good track record. They're human beings. They're having a disagreement. It happens. It's okay. They worked with Clement. You know who Clement is, that guy? You know that everyone apparently knows and he's using his name, so he, he must be somebody. And he says he w they worked with him, so don't look down on them. Just because you see a shortcoming or a failure, don't let your world fall apart and say, oh my God, is Christianity real? I mean, I just saw another Christian involved in something that humans do. And, you know, it's like, it, it, it happens, understand? But to remember that they are vital and effective leaders. What an awesome leader Paul is. Isn't he? He, he, he deals with the problem without letting the community look at these ladies as anything less. That's awesome, amen? No matter what weaknesses and temporary shortcomings they have revealed, their names are still written in the book of life. Ultimately, ultimately, their names are still written in the book of life. Amen? We are reminded again that they are still citizens of heaven and should not be considered as anything less. When you look at your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're going to see good times. You're going to see bad th times. You're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Why? Because we're a family. We're a church. We're a community. We see all sorts of things. Pastor Dan's right. When you see certain things, there may be this instinctive human side of you that says, fight, fight, fight. And that's wrong. When the selfless, like-minded, like Christ, love of God should compel you to say, peacemaker, peacemaker, amen? Let's not look any less. That's reminded that we're, our names are written in the book of life. We're all serving the same kingdom. Our focus is on Christ, on the resurrection of our eternal citizenship in heaven. Amen. And anything else that we could confront is minor in compared to that, which is why it's so joyful that Paul spent these three chapters building us into this joyful mindset of what the realities of Christianity is then dealt with the problem. It's awesome, right? Amen? Very, very wise. <clears throat> Since this is a community matter, his wish is that the entire community participates in intercession and bringing the divisive dispute to end. He says, guys, we're all involved in this over here. We all need to be a part of the reconciliation. We all need a part of just understanding the disputes and getting over them and just remembering as a community and as a church together, we're still serving God together. We could disagree about things. There are some of us in the church who disagree about major theological points, could argue about it, could go at each other's throats about it, right? But should we stop serving the kingdom of God, advancing the gospel? Should we have those quarrels and disputes and heated debates in front of people who just walked through the door of the church? No. Do people do that sometimes? Yes. And what is Paul teaching us? That's a problem. When you do stuff like that, it affects people. We shouldn't do that. Amen? So whether this is timely or not to you, this is something that we learn tonight. Amen? And the Holy Spirit w does what? Teaches us and reminds us at the right times to remember things like these so that, you know, we, we are not discouraged from walking in faith, remembering it's wise to accept that we're human beings and you're going to see humanity in Christians, amen? Verse 4, he says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. Say it again. Rejoice. It's like, what? Like bipolar over here? He like just, uh, he just like uh, brought us into this downer, bringing up these two ladies in a negative situation, and he comes right back out and he says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Paul reminds them again to be full of joy in the Lord. Paul commandingly reminds them, not suggestingly. Rejoice is a good idea. He says, I say it again. Rejoice. We dealt with something. It happens. We have to. But don't forget what I said four verses ago when we were talking about the resurrection, what our priority is, what we look forward to. He says, rejoice, amen? What is joy? What is joy? What would, when you hear the word joy, what do you think of? Mitch. Hmm, okay. Pure happiness in light of 
something that is happening or going to happen? Okay, okay. Anyone else? Pastor Nancy. Hmm. Hmm. So joy is not connected to circumstances and it is not moved by emotions. It is not invoked by emotions. It's something that's there. Amen. Anyone else? Joy. What is your what comes to mind? Give me your layman's explanation of joy. It's not a big word. We've all heard it. Deborah, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> joy, what is your definition of joy, Deborah? Awesome. Um, I, I can't do that. <laughs> it's an attitude and it's a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else, Joy? So when we as people in the world could go through situations in life that could bring us anxiety, bring us to lows, bring us to sadness, make us feel despair, when you have the truth of the reality of, of God living inside of you, not just you're hearing about <coughs> it, you've come to know it, it's come alive, you're alive in understanding the reality of God, faith. When you know and you know and you know, because that's what faith does. When you come to that point in your walk with God where it's not a question anymore, when somehow miraculously you've moved to just knowing and you look at it and you're like, God, I have no idea how you brought me to this place of a surety in faith, being sure of the things that I cannot see, but knowing that they're real, knowing that they're real. Without the shadow of a doubt, I know that they're real. There's so much joy that is the foundation, no matter what you go through in life. That's what we have as Christi in Christianity. That's what the Spirit of God brings into your life. That's what the wisdom of God brings us in our life. When no matter what we go through, you can't escape from the truth. You just know it's there. And my prayer is if that there's anybody here who does not feels like they have not moved into that place of a surety, of faith, of knowing and knowing and knowing that this is real, and you can't even debate it with yourself, then seek first the kingdom of God his, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Keep seeking and praying and ask God, God, I want, I, I want to have faith like that. Amen? Amen. Deborah. Hmm. Amen. Joy affects your perspective in your circumstances in life. Amen. Victoria.
Is it a joy that surpasses understanding? <laughs> That's what we're talking about tonight. Amen. It's true. In, 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 in my past, I existed in real darkness, real despair. It, it, it makes no sense to anyone who would meet me today and say, I couldn't even imagine that you were at that place. It's like, yeah. But this is what God does. This is what joy is. It changes you. The Spirit of God does change you. I, you wouldn't even believe if I told you the darkness that I lived in one day. But it was real. Very, very real. Very, very dark. Very, very nasty. And to see what God's done, that's what the Spirit of God does in our life. That's a joy. And Paul says, hey, this is, this is the gospel for the world, guys. This is, gospel, this is, this is what the peace for the world, amen, that God brings. Joy is not a feeling of happiness. It is a mental attitude. What you guys have been saying, right? Happiness depends on what happens. But joy derives from a conviction that despite our present circumstances, God is in control. Amen. When you have faith and you know that and you believe that, you're immovable to an extent. You could feel a little low, but there's a joy that surpasses understanding there. Amen? We have joy in knowing that we're united with Christ, we have been promised a resurrection, and that we're all partners with each other. We have joy in knowing that the miraculous God moves in circumstances. And when you see a miracle like that, you're just reminded, I'm worried about what in life? When there's a mighty God who reigns over the universe and eternity and wants to know me personally and has invited me into his kingdom and is working on my soul and working on my life and wants to talk to me and wants to help me be better and wants to help me change, and I'm worried about what? Amen? You can't always rejoice in your circumstances. So true, right? But you can always rejoice in the Lord. Yeah, Matter-of-factly. Amen? Then he says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Paul reminds them to be considerate. And uh, the translation of this word considerate is a forbearing spirit or gentleness. Okay? So he, reminds, uh, he, he, he says, let everyone see that you are gentle, that you have a forbearing spirit. Amen? Gentleness and consideration accepts other people's faults and when provoked does not seek revenge. He says, show the world. Let people see that God is working in your lives, bringing you to this place of maturity and wisdom that even when you see a situation like these two ladies, you're not incited to go fight, fight, fight but let the world see that you want to be a peacemaker. Amen? It is the opposite of being contentious and self-seeking. And he's been saying this whole time, be like-minded with Christ. Amen? Mitch. Yeah. And that's just wisdom. When you see a situation, have compassion and know that there must be some story behind it. Understand that they're human beings. They have a disagreement. It may be an unnecessary. They may be like we're talking about the other time in a moment of being irrational. And what, what do we learn? That everyone has the capacity to be irrational at times. It, there's not irrational people. There is all of us who can be irrational at times. So maybe that's what's happening. And it's wise just to look at them gently, with wisdom, accepting, not being caught up in the, I, 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 in the dispute and taking sides, but just knowing wisely to say, okay, let's be a peacemaker in this situation. Amen? But they may not be happy. Because, like David told us, it's a small group of saying, they probably wanted to do the same thing, and they just had a disagreement over how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Because even though we're saved and we know want the same thing, we want the whole world to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. We don't, we don't know the details of what they were arguing about. It may not have even been that big or something devastating, but it just may be that two people are disagreeing about something small but still having a big effect. And, and we do that sometimes as Christians. You know, even though we're saved, sometimes we'll, you know, Amen. people will really, like, like arguing about theology, like it's uh, you're, like your enemies almost. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it looks bad. It looks bad. 
But is it real? Does it happen? Yes. But Paul says, be careful. Be careful how you conduct your disagreements. With Peter. And maybe this is where he learned that life lesson. Maybe. maybe that's where he realized, and he's like, well. But in, in one of his later books, he says everyone's welcome to the mm. So, yeah, definitely, you should definitely try to get that from him. Just because you're saved and full of the Holy Spirit, full of love to God and your fellow man, you're still Yeah, we're still imperfect people, amen? Contention must have seeped into the relationships in the church. A gentle, accepting attitude goes a long way in diffusing quarrels. Amen? He says the Lord is near. Paul directs their attention back to an encouraging reality. He's dealt with something, but he always brings us back to the joy and the encouragement. The Lord is near. Amen? Paul reveals how temporary quarrels look. They look trivial and foolish when seen from the perspective of the Lord's return. That's what he does here. He says, you guys are arguing over this? Or you guys are getting caught up in this? Or your life is falling apart because of this? Think about the return of Christ. How minor does these fleeting things that we could experience in life, these moments that we get swept up in, that could have devastating effects on, the, on our walk with God and our faith. Why are you letting those affect you? Think about Christ. Think about the return of Christ. Think about the resurrection. And suddenly, all of that is so minimized. And you're like, wow, you're so right. There's so many greater things to care about in life. Amen? It is easy to get affected and consumed by what's currently trending. But always think about how small that moment is in compared to eternity. Amen? Just think about it as a like, little dot in eternity. It's like, wow, what life-changing decisions did I make in that moment? that affected eternity. Amen? Never make any major life-changing decision based on a passing moment in time. What major life-changing decisions could you make? Well, I saw them arguing, I'm leaving the church. And you walk out the church and you leave and you never hear more of the gospel that sets you free. How tragic. And we can have that effect on people sometimes. Amen? All right, let's go on. He says, don't worry about anything. Other translations say, be anxious in nothing. Amen? So we're dealing with anxiety tonight. Be anxious in nothing. Is that possible? Amen? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. Or, other translation, God's peace, which surpasses our understanding. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a good and bad anxiety, amen? Paul was anxious. Paul lost sleep over his anxiety. He was anxious about the churches. And he says, I've even lost sleep over this. But his anxiety fueled passion. Amen? But it's important to understand this. So anxiety exists. We can go through anxious times in our lives. But Paul is saying here, be anxious about nothing. Instead, pray about everything. Amen? Paul has anxiety for the progress of the gospel, the condition of the individual churches, and he even lost sleep uh, over his thoughts. His anxiety fueled his passion but anxiety can also stop you in your tracks. So here we see Paul confronted with anxiety, but for some reason Paul's anxiety led him and his passion to do something and to get out of the anxiety. Something happened. There's a secret that Paul has when he was dealing with anxiety in his life where that anxiety fueled him out of the anxiety. Amen? But anxiety does what to many of us? It stops us in our tracks. It keeps us up. We want to do something about it, but we can't because we're so anxious and consumed by anxiety. And here we read in the Bible 
Be anxious in nothing. And it sounds like such great advice. What does Paul have to teach us? Amen? His anxiety uh, fueled his passion, but anxiety can also stop you in your tracks. Because, uh, but his passion was founded on truth. Anxiety was fueled by passion, and his passion was founded on truth. So he has anxious thoughts. There's anxiety, but there's a foundation. And it goes back to what we're talking about on joy, about joy. He has anxiety, but the foundation that exists, no matter what anxiety he's, he's facing, is truth. No matter what I'm experiencing right now, God is sovereign. God is eternal. God can do anything. With God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Paul provides an effective solution when confronting anxiety. Now, this could sound like good stuff, okay? This could sound good. It's nice to hear something to get us out of anxiety. But it's important to actually apply what we learned tonight because we see that it works. It's important. Instead of worrying, pray. Sounds so simple, right? When dealing with anxiety, he says, instead of worrying, pray. Instead of wasting that consuming time with dreadful thoughts, spend that valuable time talking to God. You ever have nights where you're anxious and you're just lying there in bed, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and you're anxious, your heart is racing, you can't sleep, you need to get up in, in three more hours, you got work in the morning, but you can't, you're anxious, you got all these things running through your mind. Three hours have just gone by, nothing has changed except you're more anxious. You ever have a night like that? Yeah. Amen. Imagine if you prayed for those three hours. Imagine if you talked to God in those three hours. It sounds so simple, I know. It's something we're like, all right, that sounds simple. But the hard part is actually doing it, is actually going back and saying, I'm going to do this tonight. I have anxiety. I'm scared. I'm worried. I'm consumed by these thoughts that are driving me crazy. I, there's, there's, in my mind, there's no solution. There's no escaping this. There's no getting out of it. It's just my reality. It's my circumstances, what I'm facing in life. But does that anxiety feel passion founded on truth when you say, no matter what I'm facing right now, there's still eternity. There's still the resurrection. This time is still going to pass one day. I will get over this. I will get through this. And one day I will live with my Savior in eternity. And I'm, I'm going to have nothing to be anxious about. Does that truth exist at the foundation of your thoughts? Because that truth existed at the foundation of Paul's thoughts. Here he is in a prison cell. He's get losing sleep over thinking about the churches. And he doesn't say, oh man, I'm just going to have another sleepless night thinking about these things that are stressing me out and, and I care. What does he do? Chapter 1, he says, I've been praying for you. Not only have I been praying for you, I've been listening to God and he's been helping me know what to say to you. So I've been spending these anxious times where I could be doing nothing but wasting time feeling anxious. I've been spending this time talking to God and listening to God, actually hearing back some feedback. And as a result, instead of anxiety stopping me in my tracks because I'm looking at, there's nothing I can do. The Philippian church is falling apart. There's disunity. That's it. They're done. Unless I go back there in person, they're just going to fall apart. There's nothing I can do. That's not what he does. He says, God, what do I do? God says, write them this. Teach them this. Let me help you understand what they're going through. Through my spirit, let me help you. Let me give you the words to, to teach them, to write them. And he did. And out of anxiety, which could have stopped him in his tracks, God provided a solution. So do you see the reality of that? It is a reality, amen? <clears throat> Start by thinking about who God really is and what he has already done and be reminded of God's ultimate love and faithfulness to your eternal well-being. Remember who God really is. He is ultimately concerned about your eternal well-being. Do you believe that? but I'm a Christian, I shouldn't go through any times in life of despair or anxiety or, or, or bankruptcy or anything like that. I shouldn't experience this because that's not what the televangelist said. He said that I should be blessed and if I'm not, I'm in sin and, and that must be what's going on right now. No, we face things in life, but God is ultimately concerned about your eternal well-being. Do you believe that though? 
Are you founded on the truth? When you have anxious thoughts, is that the foundation? Because if it's not, then we need to ask God, God, help me in my unbelief. Amen? Amen. As a result, you will experience a peace that surpasses understanding. This is a peace that surpasses our understanding. A peace that is not common to us. A peace that belongs and exists in God that he gives to us because he cares about us. There are things that we can go through in life where we can be so consumed and so anxious that it would break a person. But God says, I can provide a peace that surpasses understanding, that is beyond a peace that you could get by, by even a solution to your problem. A peace that even in your circumstances, even in knowing something bad is still going to happen, even knowing that you, you may not get what you want at the end of this, but I'll still give you peace in this situation. Does that really exist out there? Yes, in the Spirit of God, amen? The truth will fuel your passion and lead you to healthy thoughts in God's direction to find a solution to move forward. The root idea of the verb to be anxious means to be pulled apart. He says, don't let your life get pulled apart by your thoughts, by these anxious thoughts that you're having, or even by your realistic circumstances. Don't let your life get pulled apart if you know the truth that there is a God out there and there's an eternity and there's heaven and there's a resurrection. And this, again, is just going to be another moment in time compared to eternity when you look back and you're like, wow, I can't believe I was consumed. I thought I was going to die. I thought my life was over in that time. And you look back and you're like, wow, amen? Don't allow your lives to be so wrapped up with material well-being that when your standard of living is strained, you fall apart. Amen? Remember that God is our provider, our comforter, and our prince of peace. Amen. The reality is at the foundation of your anxious thoughts. He says here, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. It's like a formula over there. If I do that when I'm anxious, if I tell God what I'm asking for and I thank him for all he's done and I'm reminded about God's faithfulness and consistency and that he's eternally concerned about my soul and my well-being, maybe he has reason for letting me go through this in life. Maybe I'm going to learn something through this. And if we don't know this, and if we're not taught this, we don't read our Bible and we get something like this out of us, uh, the likelihood of anxiety stopping us in our track is likely. It happens. I've been stopped in my tracks by anxiety. I've had stomach aches, sleeplessness, I, I, horrible. But now I have God. And it's true. I can testify to this. When at the foundation you could look at any circumstance and say, I don't understand this, but God is in control. I really believe that. I don't know how he moved me to this point of faith in my life. I'm so grateful that he did because I couldn't get here by myself. But he's done something. He's done a shift in me. And for whatever reason, I'm facing a circumstance that could, that would have stopped me in my tracks. But for some reason, I have peace about it. I don't understand it. It surpasses understanding. I have a peace about it. I just trust God ultimately. I'm even joyful in even saying, no matter what happens, at least I'll spend eternity with my Savior. Wow, that's great. That's great. Amen? He says, he said, Paul also doesn't want them to be anxious about what happens to him. People who are confident in the coming of the kingdom of God are not troubled by anxiety when momentary trouble comes. He says, tell God what you need. Not because God doesn't know what you need, but because it reminds us of our dependence on God. Tell God what you need because it reminds us of our dependence on God. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. Amen? When your prayers are accompanied with thanksgiving, you are prepared to surrender to the goodwill of God, which is orchestrated from God's desire for your eternal well-being. A thankful spirit overcomes selfish pride checks fear, diffuses anger, 
and directs our thoughts outwardly toward the well-being of others, the church, what the church is supposed to be, being like-minded with the selflessness of Christ. Amen? He accepted the, uh, Christ accepted the Father's will for what appeared to be a misfortunate situation in order to fulfill the good will of God. That's our example, Christ. Our thoughts are not his thoughts, and, his, and he sees the big picture. Amen? The peace of God is a peace that he possesses and gives to others. God's peace leads us to contentment. When you can be content in all circumstances in life. Amen? The peace of God is not something that you might experience in your soul, but it is something that should reign over the community. Wow. God's peace is not something that should just satisfy your soul and make you feel good, but his peace should affect and reign over the community. Amen? His peace, and this is where we're ending, it says here, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. As you live in Christ Jesus, his peace will guard your hearts and your minds. God desires your well-being. You believe that? Yes. He desires your well-being. He wants to guard your heart and mind because Proverbs says, guard your heart above all else. Why? For it determines the course of your life. God cares about guarding your heart and soul because he cares about the outcome of your life. And he knows that people could go through situations that could break them. Yet he supplies a peace that surpasses understanding because he doesn't want those moments in time when they're only a moment compared to eternity to affect someone in such a way that affects the rest of their future and eternity. He says, when you go through those times, come to me. I will provide the peace that surpasses understanding because I care about the course of your life. And I will provide whatever peace you need so that the course of your life is not affected by the anxiety that you're experiencing. Amen? Praise God. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Remember that prayer is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. This is important, okay? When you pray, always, in your prayer time, take time to listen to. Next time you pray, take time to listen also. Don't just say amen and then stand up and walk away. When you pray, always take time to listen in your prayer. Amen? Let's all pray. Father God, we come before you tonight, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your awesome, awesome word, Lord. Thank you for taking us through great depths into this, uh, these scriptures, Lord God, and just uh, seeing what's happening in the Philippian church, and Lord God, just teaching us life lessons that are going to constantly be reminded to us and uh, any time we face these circumstances in life, Lord. God, I pray for anyone dealing with anxiety in this church. Father God, I pray that you supply peace that surpasses understanding, Lord God. Let that truth, let that reality, Lord God, be known to us, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that you will uh, give us this foundation of faith, Lord God, and belief in you, Lord Jesus, that we can uh, just do what we're called to do, Lord God, and not get swept away by any, anything, Lord God, any temporary situations, but, Lord God, that we may ultimately serve your kingdom, Lord God, advance your gospel, and win souls for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. God, I pray a blessing over this church here. I pray, Father God, that, um, Lord, that you'll just be with us as we leave. Bless our families. Bless our calling, Father God. I pray that you take the gifts and the tithes that we offer tonight, Lord God. Use them for your kingdom. Use them for your glory, Lord God. And, Father God, we just thank you again, Lord. Thank you for Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Give and be blessed. <laughs>